Yep, it is that time of year. It's Christmas Eve. Here we are. Tonight, everybody will do their Christmas Eve traditions. You'll do all your stuff. Tomorrow, you'll have all your Christmas traditions. This week, everybody will do the Christmas traditions. You'll have to go to people's houses that hopefully you like. If you don't, don't tell anybody because it is the holidays. You'll go there. You'll eat food. You'll open gifts. You'll have specific ways you open gifts, specific ways you do things, and we call it Christmas. And it's a weird holiday when you remove um, what it is you're actually celebrating. I was uh, flipping through YouTube as I'm prone to do. Uh, sometimes I would just put like a pastor on preaching something or talking about something. Or, you know, I'll put on like rock music from the eight. You know, you know how YouTube works. Or like some guy changing a radiator in his truck. It just matters. Whatever pops up, that's what I clicked on. But there was a commercial on, and so it's this little kid, you know, and it's like the Hallmark Christmas. The kid's like opening his, his presents, and he, he looks up at his mom, and he goes, Mom, it's what I always wanted. And she goes, that's the magic. That's the reason for the season. And I wanted to smash my phone. Um, because I really think that's where we are in the world. We've kind of forgotten what it is that we are celebrating. I feel like every year when Christmas rolls around, I have to, I have to dig back through like, what is it we're celebrating? If you remove Jesus for Christmas, then what are we doing? You ever stop and think about, like, if, if you take out the religious nature of what the holiday is about, it's a really strange holiday, right? You just picked, like, some random day in the winter that this is now the day where we're going to put up Christmas trees and cover them in lights for reasons nobody knows, and then people are going to dress up in red and wear hats and give gifts to children. Uh, and we're going to do all of the weird Christmas tradition stuff. And we're going to make cookies. And we're going to put like, candles in windows. And all of these strange things. But what's the point? Like, what are we doing if it's not about Jesus? Like, what are we celebrating? What is going Like, it's such a weird thing when people are like, well, I don't want to, you know, it's, I'm not religious, but I like Christmas. How? How can you like Christmas and not be religious? It doesn't make any sense. What are you, ce what are you celebrating? What are you doing? I at least have respect for uh, you know, the weird religions out there and the different views where they're like, well, we don't celebrate Christians because, or Christmas because we're not Christian. Well, good for you. At least you've got some ground to stand on. It's really strange to me to live in a world where people are like, I don't believe in God. I don't believe any of this thing is real. I think religion is the opiate of the masses. I'm not going to go after this. Or, but then on the other end of it, I love Christmas. What do you love? You, or you like getting stuff. So that's what it is, right? So we've taken this idea about we're going to choose this day to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Um, and, and instead, we're not going to do that. We're going to celebrate by giving people things because we like to get new stuff. Now, here's the thing. Growing up when you were a kid, we all live for that, right? You make that list. You give it to mom. If you're old school, you got that big old magazine in the mail, right? You didn't care about anything in it but the toy section, just flipping through all the other pages. Don't care, don't care, don't care. Close. And then you get a marker, and you're circling, like, the whole toy catalog. You're just circling every box, everything. And then you, like, take it to your mom, and you're like, I've made my list. Buy me these things. Now, I was talking to my little brother two nights ago about prepping for this, and I was like, can you remember anything that you circled in that catalog? And Chris was like, you know, the only gift I really ever remember getting was the Nintendo and the only reason I remember that was because Dad lied to us for six months about how we would never get a Nintendo, and that was for kids who had parents had the money to buy Nintendos, and he wasn't going to buy a $200 gift for his children to have. And then we opened our gift, and Dad was like, that's right, that's from me. <laughs> but otherwise, like, I can't remember back in my childhood and go, oh, that was the Christmas I got X. That was the Christmas I got this thing or that thing. But I can remember that being like an important part of it. Which brings me to the thing today that I feel like we've kind of lost sight maybe about what it is you're celebrating. And so I thought I have a microphone and uh, have you under my control until you figure out that I can just talk and talk and talk. So might as well, let's do some training so when you're celebrating Christmas, you can be like, oh yeah, this is what we're doing. Now we're going to start today in uh, the book of Matthew. Like I said, we're going to be all over the place. The book of Matthew, uh, chapter 1, verse 18 says this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with a child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So there you go. There's the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, normally in traditions, we do Luke 2. That's the one everybody knows, right? In the days of Caesar Augustus, that one. But today we're going to do this one because I want to focus on uh, spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, uh, if you're reading that, you may go, that seems like it contradicts itself because it says, the prophet says they shall call his name Emmanuel, but then it says down here, but uh, he knew her not until she'd given birth to a son, and then he called his name Jesus. So you got two things true to begin with. You got a they and a he. They shall call his name Emmanuel, uh, and he named him Jesus. So what's going on? So we're not confused. So you understand when we sing, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, what it is you're actually saying. Emmanuel is a description of the name Jesus. So when it says they called his name Emmanuel, they literally said, when people hear the name Jesus, they will think that's God with us. That's what uh, the prophet is getting at. Now, this prophet, if you don't know, this is Isaiah. This is out of the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. At some point here in Vintage, we'll go through Isaiah because it's a fun book. But this is out of the seventh chapter where he writes this out and says this thing that be, you know, we'll give birth and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, here's the thing about Isaiah. Isaiah is super popular in the New Testament. 21 times it's quoted in the Gospels. 57 times it's quoted in the whole New Testament. It's a book, uh, when you start to study and look at it, it's caused a lot of problems for non-believers. Lots of problem with the old book of Isaiah. Now, here's why. Isaiah is written 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Right? 700 years before Jesus was born, this dude prophesies these things, and they write it down. Now, Isaiah, he's a prophet under King Amos. Uh, the, the place is corrupt. It's wild. He's married to a prophetess, which we know nothing about other than it says it is. So they're like the prophetess couple, prophet and prophetess, both talking for God, both wandering around, both saying things, and it gets pretty wild. Now, here's where the book gets fun. Isaiah predicts the Babylonian exile 200 years before it happened. Now you may go, well, whatever, it's the Bible. Yeah, but listen, 200 years before Babylonian exile can occur, uh, Babylon doesn't even exist. He predicts Babylon will exile the Jews. Now remember, uh, if you were around for the Daniel, or for, when we went through uh, Hosea and we went through and Nehemiah, the rebuilding of the walls, that's the Babylonian exile. If you weren't, here's it in a nutshell. Uh, the Jews were sinful. They wouldn't do what they were supposed to. They got so frustrated, God sent them into exile. He had them destroyed. But uh, he still hung that he would still save them. So there was a remnant who go into exile, but he said, I've not forgotten you, but this is necessary because you've been so sinful and so broken. That prophecy comes out of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah predicts that. Now, not only does Isaiah predict the Babylonian exile, he also predicts that the city will be sacked by the Assyrians and destroyed, laid to rest, but then be rebuilt so that then it can come and they can exile Jerusalem 200 years before it happens. It's so exact and it's so correct that liberal Bible scholars who don't believe that the Bible is um, ordained, that don't believe in prophecy, that have to give an account for how can somebody know something 200 years before it's supposed to do, they made this whole thing up where they said, well, here's the thing. Obviously, you got multiple authors, right? 1 through 39 of Isaiah, that's probably the actual Isaiah talking, but when you get into the back half of the book, that's somebody else who's pretending to be Isaiah. So because of that, John and Jesus saw fit to quote Isaiah both from the beginning and the end and said, this is as the prophet Isaiah said. And if you don't want to believe the Bible, that's fine, but that's there, uh, and that happened. Now the thing about Isaiah, it also has the most prophecies about Jesus, uh, it predicts all kinds of things about who Jesus is going to be. His virgin birth, that he'd be from Nazareth, that he would heal the deaf and cause the blind to see, that his message would be rejected by the Jews, uh, that he would be beaten, his beard would be pulled out and he'd be spit upon, that he would be scourged or whipped, that he would be pierced for our sins and transgression, he'd be put to death for the sins of the world, uh, he would redeem mankind from the sin, he would resurrect from the dead, and here's the real great one, he'd be buried in a rich man's grave. True, 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 true. All of those are fulfilled. Isaiah predicts them all 
700 years before Jesus was born. So guess what liberal scholars did then? We had to have an author around the New Testament time. Couldn't have been that was true. That's insane. Nobody can predict the future that far ahead and be that right. He's that right. There's not one, there's not one thing in the book of Isaiah where he predicted something that it doesn't come true so that we can go see the Bible's made up and it's all fake. And it's made. Nope. We got to have multiple authors to try to explain this thing away because we can't find a spot where he was wrong. Enter the Maseratic text. Now, you may be going, Pastor Pat, my eyes are glossing over. Bear with me. The Maseratic text, if you don't know, was the oldest copy of the Bible that we had before the Dead Sea Scrolls. That copy of the Maseratic text, the book of Isaiah, is 800 years after Jesus. 800 A.D. That's what we had. Now, for years, Bible scholars said, see, we have this copy at 800 A.D., and that's how we know that somewhere along the line, New Testament people added things to the book of Isaiah so that you can account for Jesus. That's what they were doing. Blah, 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 blah. Then the Dead Sea Scrolls happen. Now, if you don't know the story of the Dead Sea Scrolls, here's what happened. Some kid is fishing on the Dead Sea, sees a cave. I'm going in there like kids do, right? Goes in the cave, finds all these pots full of scrolls. And he's like, this is probably important, right? So he he gets a hold of a bunch of Jewish guys. and He's like, I think I found a bunch of old uh, Bible stuff. Like, I think I found the, like, this is really, uh, so they show up. It's the oldest copies we have. Now, there in the uh, scrolls of the Dead Sea, there is a copy of Isaiah. Now, it's not a book. It's a scroll, hence Dead Sea Scroll. Buckle in and stay with me this morning. The scroll is 24 foot long. 24 foot laid out from end to end. It's a complete copy of the whole book. So all of the liberal dorks. We're like, finally, we're going to be liberated because they dated it, and it's 100 years before Jesus. So it's older than Christ, 100 years before. So like, we're going to take the Maseratic text that's at 800 AD, we're going to take this copy that's pre-Jesus, and we're going to be able to lay them out, and then we're going to be able to point out all the discrepancies. We can disprove this thing. We're going to know everything. It's going to be great. We're going to have it figured out. We'll finally show that Christianity is made up, and it can just be about being nice to people, and it can just be about the things Jesus said, but we can say, look at all this myth. And they laid it out, and they looked, and guess what they found? Nine errors. Guess what the errors were? The way people spelled their names or the spellings of locations. Nine letters. 800-year gap. 900-year gap, nine-letter difference, like spelling color with a U, that type of thing. When it got done, like, now when you read about it, they're like, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe there was multiple authors. Maybe they knew about it before then. Maybe it's coincidence. Coincidence? It's coincidence. So now you have to go with, well, no, now all of the Gospels, they're all made up. That's, all, that's where the jokes, that's what they, they were the one. They took Isaiah and used it as source material to write the Gospels out. Except the Gospels are eyewitness accounts written within 40 years of the life of Jesus Christ when everybody's still alive. Like, we want to pretend like, well, in the time of Jesus, you know, people didn't talk. Are you insane? Like, if somebody came to earth and said, I was fully God, born a virgin, you don't think somebody would, like, go, <laughs> that's not true. I was, uh, Jesus, we know Marion. Not a virgin. Like, that doesn't happen. Why? Well, because uh, the story that we have and the thing that we have laid out in front of us, they, they can't disprove it, so they just tried to crush it. So when you read early church history, they just try to kill off the early church. They don't try to discredit it because they can't. So when you read a verse out of Isaiah that says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they'll call his name Emmanuel. You are not talking about something that was said in the moment. You are talking about 900 years of tradition of people waiting for a God to be amongst them to redeem them from the brokenness of this world. God with us is a wildly unique concept inside of any religion. There is no religion where God is imminently involved with people like Christianity. It just doesn't exist. Yet in what we believe and who we are, we know that God became man and came to earth. When you look at that verse, it says, Therefore the Lord 
himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. You have pure Christology on full display. He's fully human because he's born of a virgin and bear a son. There's no weirdness going on here. We don't have to get into weird heretical teaching. It wasn't like he was God sometimes. He's born a human being, limited himself, but he was Emmanuel. He was God with us. He's fully man, fully God come to earth, which fits the theme of Isaiah. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Which is a weird concept in the book, because the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are about how terrible the Jewish people are. Like, it's a mess. They're offering sacrifices in the temple to false gods, and the kings and the priests are allowing it. Like, they have forsaken who God is and what he has for them. They've lost sight of what it is they believe. They're doing whatever they want. Isaiah's like, you're going to face the judgment and wrath of God. Babylon is going to descend upon us and send you all into exile. This tree that we call Jesse will be cut off at the stump. I'm going to sever this thing, but the root will remain, is what Isaiah says. It's 39 chapters of raw judgment, and in the midst of that, there's this underlying theme that he's going to somehow save them and redeem them, and there's this remnant of people that in the midst of the brokenness of this world, he has not forgotten them, and that there is hope, there is a deliverer coming, and that is Emmanuel. That is Christ, God with us. Now, you may sit there and go, what's this got to do with me? Well, look around the world we live in. Religion, a lot of times, wants you to just make it about a country club experience where you show up and everybody gives you a hug and you go, well, I feel good about myself. I showed up at church. I gave a little money, sang a little song, heard a little message, and now I can go back to my disaster. Nobody wants to talk about, like, this world's rough right now. Milk's like $6 a gallon. What's going on? Like, your grocery bill is a bajillion dollars and you're eating macaroni and cheese. Like, people are struggling. It's not easy. Relationships are rough. You may be in a marriage at Christmas time, and you're like, i got to do family Christmas with a guy that I don't even want to look at his face. Now i got to go over and sit with my in-laws and pretend like everything's hunky-dory when I'm laying at bed at night going, I wonder how bad prison is. Like, we want to pretend like everything's great and everything's hunky-dory, and religion wants to come in and show up in your life and tell you, like, hey, if you're a believer, everything's going to be wonderful. It's just a blessing. Every moment, every second is a blessing. Except when you read the Bible, that's not what's going on. It's 39 chapters of judgment. This world is 39 chapters. It's 39 times. It's God constantly reminding you just how broken this thing is. Nobody's happy. We're self-medicating like crazy. Everybody's on marijuana. Everybody's on alcohol. Everybody's taking antidepressants. Nobody can figure out how to be content or be happy. We don't know how to live. We don't know how to function. And we can't figure out why. And then when Christmas time runs around, we're supposed to celebrate God with us. We're like, oh, the magic of the season has given my kid a Nintendo. No, the magic of the season is in spite of your sinful, broken nature, God saw fit to come to earth and redeem you as you were. You want to talk about what it is you're celebrating? You want to talk about what it is that you are going after, what it is Christ is trying to accomplish? Well, what he's saying is in spite of your brokenness, in spite of your separation, in spite of how overwhelming this world feels, I'm with you. I am right beside you. It's not God came near me. It's not like God was over there. It's not like i got to show up at Vintage on Sunday so that I can see God. He's with you. Jesus, at one point, he comes into contact with a Samaritan woman who wants to know which temple she's supposed to worship in. The Samaritans, if you don't know, after the Babylonian exile, they're out of the northern kingdom. They come back. They've, uh, they intermingle with tribes that aren't Jewish. And so then the Jewish people who are in the south are like, you're not a real Jew because you've been interbreeding. And so they're like, we're building our own temple. Well, we're going to have our temple, right? Sounds like Christmas with the in-laws. Like, I don't know, you're not going over there. These guys are all fighting and angry. Nobody can get along. And this Samaritan woman comes to Jesus and goes, which temple's right? Validate me. Jesus says this to her, there's coming a day when you won't worship in a temple, but you'll worship in spirit and truth. God won't be in a location, God will be where? Right beside you, 
right near you, right in the garbage, right in the pain and the hurt and the frustration. You want to know why you buy gifts for people at Christmas time? You want to know why you get together with family, you make cookies, you hang out, you have a good time, you celebrate, you love each other, you do all those traditions? Because God saw fit to love you in spite of who you were. That in spite of what we deserve, in spite of the judgment we have earned, in spite of our first 39 chapters, God, in spite of all of that, looked down from heaven and said, despite them being sinners, I love them and I'm going to die and resurrect for them. And it's in that moment in history then that we see God come into earth as a child, born into a bunch of nobodies in the stable with a bunch of, like, he doesn't do this at all in the right way. You want to get more into, well, I'm skeptical. I don't know if it's true. Well, then, if listen, if it's made up, they were terrible at making it up. So he's going to be the king of the world and the redeemer of mankind. He's going to be born to a 14-year-old girl that everybody's going to think got pregnant out of wedlock, married to some older guy who we don't know if it's his first, second, third wife. We don't know anything more about him than he saw fit to stay with her because he was faithful to what God said. She's born in a stable because they didn't get to the place in time, out in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of sheep. And then he goes and lives in Nazareth. The Bible literally says nothing good comes from Nazareth. I'm, po- I'm posting up there. W- what are you doing? That's what we're going to do? And then he's going to pick his disciples and his followers to bring the truth into the world. And so I'm going to make it up. Who should we give this king of the world, this story we're going to tell? Well, don't you think we should give him the rabbis, the politicians, the people who are popular? That's who we're going to pick to put with Jesus so that we can advance this message. We're making this thing up. We're building a religion. We're like L. Ron Hubbard in Scientology. we got to get a good one going here and make a buck. No, no, don't do that. Give him the fishermen. The fishermen? You know the people fish in this town because they couldn't do anything else. Yeah, give them the fi- those, those boys they call the Sons of Thunder, the ones that get in fist fights every night down at the bar, those guys. We'll make them, and then let's pick the zealots, the guys that are hiding knives in their coats, killing people, everybody's afraid to be around them, and some tax collectors. Tax collectors? We're going to give him tax collectors? Yeah, the tax collectors. Everybody hates them. They hate them so much, they have to pay people to come hang out with them. What? I think they made it all up, though. No, they didn't. This is what he did, and he did it because he wanted to bring validity to the fact that he could redeem that which the world says is irredeemable. If he'd have punched a bunch of religious, hoity-toity, look how much I got it together, country club type folk, would you have really looked at it and goes, oh, that's got it work? No, he punched a bunch of drunk fishermen. A bunch of, say- there's a reason why when your kids talk bad and you're like, you can't say those words, you go, stop talking like a what? Sailor. Stop talking like a fisherman. Jesus is like, no, I'll take them. Give me those guys. Put them, on, put them with me so that when the world looks at who I'm going to use, there will be no question of what took place here. That I am Emmanuel, God with us. That I did come to earth. And that when God comes to earth and he gets around people, it doesn't matter who they were, it's going to matter who they are. And who they are is redefined by the birth and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Isaiah doesn't leave it there. He goes, look, it's not just I'm going to predict the birth of Jesus. It's not that I'm going to predict the downfall of Jerusalem. He's right on the birth of Jesus. He's right on Jesus' life. He's not wrong in any of those prophecies. He's not wrong in any of the prophecies about Israel. But now what about the prophecies that are post-Jesus? Huh? Yeah. Isaiah prophesied the second coming. He says this, chapter 65, look, I'm creating new heavens and a new earth. Think about this. You want to know what to celebrate at Christmas? Here you go. Get out your Bibles, go to chapter 65 of Isaiah, and read this to your kids. I'm creating new heaven and a new earth. No one will even think about the old one anymore. Be glad. Rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and delight my people, and the sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. No longer will babies die when only a few days old. No longer will adults die before they have lived a full life. No longer will people be considered old at 100. Only the cursed will die that young. In those days, people will live in the houses they build and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. Unlike the past, the invaders will not take their houses and confiscate their vineyards. My people will live as long as trees. My children will have time to enjoy their hard-won gains. They will not work in vain, and their children will not be doomed to misfortune. 
There are people blessed by the Lord, and their children too will be blessed. I will answer them before they even call to me. While they're still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The snakes will eat dust. In those days, no one will be hurt or destroyed on my holy mountain. I, the Lord, have spoken. God with us. He came as a mild-mannered sheep to show God's love and affection, and he took the glory of the cross upon himself, and we celebrate that at Christmas. But we must not forget that he did not leave it there, and he is going to return as a conquering king with flame in his eyes and a sword in his hand to set this world right forever. And he is going to establish a heaven and an earth that will show that he is within it and a part of it. And he has given us an opportunity to get our lives in order so that when he returns, we can be a part of what it is he has for us. You know what you should celebrate? That God is with us. That God did do what God did. That God has redeemed mankind. He didn't come to condemn you. He didn't come to make you feel bad. He came to set you free from the bondage of sin. John writes in chapter 3, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his son into this world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He became nothing so that you could be something. And here's the beauty of you don't know. Here's the beauty of the gospel that you need to know so that when you open gifts on Christmas morning, when you get together with family, this is what you're celebrating. You can't save yourself. You can't redeem yourself. You can't step outside of the 39 chapters of Isaiah. They went into Babylonian exile because they deserved it. We deserve death. But in spite of that, God saw fit to send his son to die and resurrect so we could be free. And if you believe and you embrace him and you allow him to be near you, then he will save you through him. When God looks at you, he will see his son. He will see Jesus. He will see Emmanuel. He will go, God's with them. That's Christ amongst his people. So that when you show up for your judgment day and you got to stand in front of the God who made you and you start going like, okay, this isn't going to be good. This movie is not something I want to show. Jesus can step up and go, hold on, kid, I got this. I got this. I already paid this price. For some of you, he's like, and it was a price to pay, but I paid it. I did it for you. I gave my life for you. I poured my blood out for you. I was whipped and scourged for you. It's by my stripes you are healed. It's by my pierced flesh that you are saved. I came so that you would have freedom from sin. We aren't celebrating gifts and getting garbage and creation. We're celebrating the creator who saw fit to redeem his creation through his son. And it's in this moment in history, you have this most intimate, imminent moment that God sends Jesus into this world. Isaiah writes in chapter 9, For a child is born to us, a son is given, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. In the truest, most honest way that you can say that. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. He is the conquering king, and he will return for his people, and he does not give a rip what garbage that you carry to his altar. All he cares is that you walk away carrying one thing, him. He saw fit to set you free from darkness. He saw fit to come and stand beside you. He saw fit to pay the ransom of your death and what you deserve. He became Emmanuel. 
And so on Christmas, we should sing that song. We should cry out and say, oh, come, Emmanuel, come and save me. I recognize my brokenness and my weakness. I recognize I'm not capable of saving myself. I recognize I need Jesus. My relationships are a mess. My financial life is a mess. I don't know what to do or where to go. I feel discombobulated and separated from who I'm supposed to be. Something inside of me feels empty, and I don't know what I'm supposed to be put there. It's Emmanuel. You have a hole inside of you that is made and put there so that God can fill it. And it's your decision whether or not you allow him to draw near to do that for you. And so when you have Christmas, when you celebrate that, when you come together and you decide we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus, that's what you're saying. You are saying that we're going to celebrate that God saw fit for one time in history to send his son into the world to die and resurrect so that we could be free. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. God with us. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you this morning. Lift up every person in this room. Lord, I know this season is hectic. I know it's crazy. But Lord, in this moment, if we can just have your spirit move through this room. For the broken and the skeptics, for those that have questioned and wonder whether or not you are real, whether or not this is real, Lord, I pray you would help them dig through all the garbage and all the things they've experienced and get to the heart of what it is that we believe, that you are and will always be the living, breathing God who came near to a people who did not deserve you. Lord, I pray you would set people free from the bondage of sin this Christmas Eve. Lord, I pray you would remind each and every one of us what it is that we celebrate and what it is that we believe that, Lord, you saw fit to love us in spite of our sin, that you saw fit to redeem us in spite of our sin, that you are the restorer and the deliverer and you have drawn near to your people. Lord, I pray that you would give us peace and hope in the storm of this world. That, Lord, in spite of what we look at, in spite of what we see, in spite of the chaos and the worry and the things that feel like they're overwhelming, that you will remind us that you are Emmanuel and you've not left our side, but you stand with us in the storm, a bulwark for us to cling to. We will not be tossed to and fro, but you are solid ground upon which we can stand. That no matter what this world throws at us, no matter what we walked through, that you came to earth, you lived and you breathed, you healed, you preached, you taught, and you died and resurrected so that I might be saved. Lord, we celebrate that on your, the birth of you. Lord, for every person in this room, whatever it is they're struggling with, Lord, I pray you would give them peace this morning. Lord, you would give them peace at Christmas time. You would begin to order their path and give them direction, Lord. Lord, we thank you for what it is you've accomplished through your son. We thank you for what it is you're going to accomplish as you fulfill Isaiah finally, Lord. Be with your church as we seek you. Be with your church as we go into this world. Oh, come, Emmanuel. Be God with us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.